night of the crusade. We have had a wonderful couple of nights to begin and we are now looking forward to tonight and the days to come. We recognize that the Lord is with us because the Lord is always with us. He has reconciled us to his heavenly Father and ours and he did that through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. Amen. And he uh, wants us to know how much he loves us and how much he wants us to participate with him in ministry. So we recognize that as I was speaking last night about how Jesus has reconciled us to our Heavenly Father, he uh, has set us an example of how we can participate with him today in his ministry of reconciliation that he's given to each one of us who believe in him. And so we want to appreciate the fact that what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection from the de dead was a finished work of our salvation. Uh, he uh, was of course born of the Virgin Mary and he grew up in the uh, righteousness and the fear of the Lord and at age 30 he began his earthly ministry and his earthly ministry was an expression of the reconciliation he was going to give us through his death and resurrection. So he gave us examples and he gave his disciples of the day his example of reconciliation ministry. Now he wants us to continue with that ministry on the side of his death and resurrection, on the back side of that. So you know, everything connects with Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And so he's always doing the reconciliation all the way from the Garden of Eden all the way to today and into the future. So there's uh, some very good examples. I will give as many examples as I can within my allotted time, but I do want us to appreciate the fact that Jesus is discipling us today like he discipled his original disciples. So the first story I want to share with you about how he did the ministry of reconciliation with his disciples is the woman at the well. The woman at the well in John 4. It's an amazing story and it, it should resonate within each one of us how God and Jesus work with us today. So let's begin in John 4 verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV Bible. So if you have your Bible, why don't you turn to John 4 and begin in verse 1 with me. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. And of course that made them envious of Jesus right there. Although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. They didn't realize that apparently. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. In verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. Samaria was a place that Jews did not like to go through at all they would go around Samaria to go to Galilee. But Jesus went straight through Samaria because he had an appointment with a woman at the well. His disciples were shocked that he was going to make this journey. If they had understood everything about the journey, they would have probably refused to go. It was that severe. But he had a lesson for them and for us today about how he feels about all people. He wants us to engage in this reconciliation ministry as he's doing so right here. In John 4 and verse 5, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So this had historical uh, foundation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had a well here. And the Samaritans hung on to that as to their legitimacy in their religious approach to God. Now the Jews said, well you don't worship in the temple, so your worship is not legitimate. Samaritans felt otherwise because of Jacob's well. In verse 6, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well and it was about noon. Well interestingly, you know, we think well noon would be a hustling, bustling time. But then it was hot. It was hot at noon. And the women who went to the well went in the dew of the morning when it was cooler. 
But there was going to be one woman who was going to come in the heat of the day. She was the woman the whole community ostracized, had nothing to do with. So here we have the situation where Jesus is coming into Samaria, which the Jews don't want to deal with in the first place. And then this woman, no one wants to deal with her either, even though she's a Samaritan. And they don't want to deal with her because she's had so many husbands. And they feel ashamed of her. So they, uh, they don't want to have any social dealings with her. So that even complicates the issue and shows how much Jesus goes after us, no matter what our situation, because he wants us all to know him. And he's made that very much possible through his death, forgiving us of our sins, all sin for all time, and giving us his resurrected life. So here we are, though, in Samaria. In verse 7, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, at this time, his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And it's a good thing, because they probably would have fainted dead away if they would to be there and see exactly what Jesus is going to do and how he's going to minister to this woman. But this is profound for us today. In verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, even with the Jewish people, a man would not speak to a woman who's not, who was not his wife. Uh, so he would not never ask, a teacher would have never asked a woman to get him a drink, let alone a Samaritan woman. So you see, so the complexities of this are you shouldn't even be speaking to me. Why are you asking me for a drink? In verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, if you really knew what was going on here, the tables would have turned, and you would have wanted to have asked me for that living water. And she said, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And in John 7, verse 37, you see the, the Holy Spirit is the living water that Jesus would have given to her. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Yes, as a matter of fact, he was. In fact, he was the God of Jacob. <laughs> yes, he knew Jacob very well. So Jesus answered in verse 13, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Yes, indeed. So what was he doing with this woman at the well? Well, actually, he was ministering the reconciliation that, we, that he was bringing to the world. The whole world. You see, when sin would be forgiven through his shed blood on the cross, that would open up the relationship that we needed to have with our Father. See, in the Old Testament, Jesus was the Word, and He was also called the Father at different times. He, of course, represented the Father because He was just like the Father, but He was not the Father. But the Father then sent Jesus to us so He could die on the cross, forgive us our sins, and bring us back into relationship once He was raised from the dead. And we had access to the spirit life of God. So you see what he did here, right out of the chute of his ministry. You know, he uh, had gone into the desert place. He'd been baptized in the River Jordan by the John, uh, the <laughs> John the Baptist. Sorry, and uh, and then he was tested for forty days in the wilderness, and then he chose his twelve disciples. And then the first thing, as far as I understand, is that he went to Samaria. Doesn't that just confound everybody? Yes. It is an amazing thing. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, we think we know who God is, and then he does things that just we don't understand. And it's not until later that we connect the pieces that 
It's a part of our journey. And so he's going to show immediately what his intentions are. His whole ministry is going to be based on what happens here. He's going to continue that ministry for three and a half years, and then he's going to go to the cross. On the other side of the cross, then, he's going to have us all participate in his ministry of reconciliation. Because the reconciliation ministry he has done here and is doing today continues. It continues until he comes back in his glory. This is the ministry for all believers, for the entire church to be a part of, not just some people, all people. It's given to all of us to participate in, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. So, he's saying to the woman, whoever drinks of this water will not be thirsty again, see? In verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, her original intent is, I don't want to come back in the heat of the day. I don't want to continue to be ostracized by the residents of the community. I don't want to do this anymore. This is a very burdensome task for me. So if you can give me this living water and I don't have to do this, I would be so appreciative of that. And so he told her, go call your husband and come back. Well, he knew her situation, so he knew that the person she was living with was not her husband. She said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. The one thing about reconciliation that Jesus has given to us is that he brings us into transparency. See, he knows us. He knows everything about us. So why do we need to play games? We're used to playing games in the human sphere because we seemingly can get away with it. We can deceive people. They don't need to know the whole story. I'll just give you a part of the story just to get by. For Jesus, it's all or nothing. He gave his all for us so we could be reconciled. And he wants us to give our all so we can be in, totally immersed in that reconciliation that he's given to us. So she's, she's not knowing exactly what she's doing, but she's participating because Jesus, when he comes to us, he makes it so compelling. It seems like we just want to say the truth. And tell him who we are because he already knows who we are and he's letting the lady know I know all about you so she's going to determine that he's a prophet because he's able to do that and in verse 19 she said sir I can see that you are a prophet our ancestors worshipped on this mountain but you Jews <laughs> you ever hear language like that you Jews or you this race or that race of course we have we live it in, in the world at all. We, we, we see the, it's kind of a degradation of, our, of who we are. You know, it kind of lowers our status, or lowers their status, or however that would work. You Jews claim that the place where you must worship is Jerusalem. So you think you're better than us, and that we don't have a, a way of worshiping effectively where we are. Verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, believe, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So he's going to show that the reconciliation that he gives is going to allow everyone around the world to worship him. And it has to be in a certain frame of mind and a, and a sense of being that this would happen. In other words, the whole structure of things would have to be broken down and then rearranged for this to happen. And as we know, the temple is going to be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, and it's going to take away that place of worship, and the only place of worship that Jews could worship from around the world. They'd go there on the, on the high days, especially the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day. They'd go there to worship because they had more days to work with and to be gone from wherever they came from. 
So, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. So, a historical fact he gives. This had been given to the Jewish people, but they had not honored it. Uh, their religious leaders had not embraced it, ministered it, shared it, made it holy through their thoughts and words and actions. They, they degraded it. They had sold it off to the highest bidder. And it, became, it had become nothing. In fact, it would become so much nothing during his ministry that by the time he is going to be crucified, uh, the Shekinah of God in the temple was removed, taken away. So the whole structure of things was going to change, and he, he gave that understanding to this woman. This woman no one would have anything to do with. And isn't that how God works? He goes to the person though, who's willing to receive him, no matter what the status, and he deals with that person one-on-one -on -one, as though they're the only person there. Amen to that. In, there, in that case, she was the only person there. And so he was very straightforward with her, and he, he wanted her to continue to come to him and receive his reconciliation. So, in verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will see will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. Now you see, they didn't even know the Father then. They, they, did, they, they, they didn't know who the Father was. It, it was amazing, see, but he's prophesying that this woman was going to know the Father, so he, she was going to know the Father through Jesus. But there was a time coming when the Father would be known. And again, the Father could not be known until sin was forgiven for all human beings, for all time. And then the reconciliation occurred. What divided it in the garden? Sin. What brought it back to be reconciled was forgiveness of sin. And so here this woman is going to know the Father because the Father is the one who's going to give all human beings true worship. See, Jesus was going to show us the Father, and then He was going to reconcile us to our Father. For God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in the Spirit and the truth. And who is the opposite of that? The devil, right? Amen. He's the father of all lies, and He wants to deceive us and have us not worship our Father in spirit and truth. Jesus wants us to worship our Father because, he says, you know, in the model prayer, our Father in heaven. Because when we worship our Father, we worship Him. Because our Father directs us to Him then. Jesus directs us to the Holy Spirit. And the oneness of God is known in our hearts and minds in relationship. The beautiful thing about his reconciliation he's given to us, it establishes the relationship that he's given us. When he said the prayer in John 17, he said, Father, may they be one as we are one. And as I am in you, and you and me, may we be in them, and them in us. So this is what happens when we know our Father. See, then we're included in him, and he's included in us in that intimate relationship. And then the true worship in the Spirit can occur, just naturally, because that is who we are. We're one with God. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. Sometimes all we have to know is that we have this hope. We know that it's going to happen. We have a hope of it happening. We don't have to ask all the answers for the hope to be there, to be revealed to us. We just have to do with what we know we know, what faith ever we have. That's good. God meets us on the road that we're journeying on. 
to worship. We don't have all the parts and pieces together. We're kind of scattered here and there. We're full of sin and mistakes and issues we can't ever get around. How is she ever going to get past the five husbands she had? How is she ever going to integrate in her community again? How is her life ever going to be normal again? And Jesus is going to give her away. He gives us all away. When he reconciles us and we accept the reconciliation, it gives us a fresh start. It's like the past never happened. We're a new creation at that point. We have a clean slate. and We say, oh, well, look what lies before me. I know Jesus now. That's all that matters. I am free. I'm free from sin, and I'm fully in him, and he is in me. So when he comes, he will explain everything to us, and that's the way it is. <coughs> we got the word here, but you know, unless we know him, unless he comes into us and we get, go into him, yeah, the words don't mean much sometimes. The connection is not there. The relevancy of it all. We miss it. Verse 26, And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am He. Now when Jesus did that for us, what did we do? Well, we repented, didn't we? I am He. Our hearts became soft. And we said, Oh Lord, I'm so sorry that I have not known you until now. Please forgive me for my waywardness my sinfulness, and he said, my child, you're forgiven. Here, come to me. And he said that to the woman, and she said, yes, Lord. See, that's, <laughs> that's where it ends. But you know, that isn't where it ends. Because we know by her fruit that that isn't where that ended, as far as the wording. His revealing himself to her had her repent and receive him as the Messiah, right then on the spot. So what happens after that? Well, the amazing thing is, is what should happen for all Christians. What did the woman do? Well, let's see what the woman did here. Let's go down um, to verse 34. So, the disciples now had come back from town and they brought lunch. And so they wanted to give lunch to Jesus because they figured he was hungry too. And although he was, he said to them in verse 34, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And they're saying, huh? <laughs> what? We go into town to get you food and you come up with this parable? Jesus, we just can't seem to understand you. <laughs> Don't you have a saying, it is still four months until harvest? You ever had that saying or something similar to that be said to you? Especially if you're uh, in the uh, planting and harvesting community. I'm sure that comes up often. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. So we say, well, Lord, what do you want me to do now? I believe in you. Thank you for being my Savior. Thank you for being my Lord. Now what? He says, open your eyes and look at the fields. And we say, I'm looking at the fields. I don't see anything. Look at them again. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. What was he seeing? Well, we'll find out in just a second. They're ripe for harvest, he says. They are? Really? Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Remember Jacob? Did he not put down a seed of the gospel of the Messiah to come? Did he not? Yes, yes he did. So the seed of Jacob that he planted, the harvest was there. Amen. Jacob was no longer there. But Jesus was there, and the harvest was there, so he's pointing that out to his disciples who couldn't see at that time. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. 
This is the time of harvest. This is the time of harvest before Jesus returns in glory. We have to realize that many have gone before us and put seed down. And now it's ours to harvest. And we have to say, Lord, I'm looking and I don't see anybody. And he says, look again. See what I see. The harvest is there. I wouldn't have you prepared for this unless there was a harvest to bring in. So, we will reap the benefits of their labor. Then in verse 30, well, let's continue. Let's continue on in verse 39 because this is the fruit that we're going to be looking at. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So, she met her Messiah she believed, and what did she do? She ran back to her village. Can you imagine that? They rejected her. They didn't want her in their village. And yet the first thing she did was run back to her village. You know, the thing that we need to appreciate about Jesus is that when we believe in Him, He takes our life and He uses it for His glory. Amen. The church needs to edify the members to understand that. Amen. We don't need to be put in a classroom for six to eight weeks so we can learn how the church functions. We need to be released as the reconciled people of God who have this passion to share their testimony. If Jesus said, now, now wait a minute, woman at the well. I know you feel all excited about what just happened here, but I need to sit you down here and talk to you for about two weeks so I can tell you everything you need to know before you do this. You know what would have happened if that had happened? But by then she would have forgotten all of what happened two weeks prior. <laughs> and she would have said, well, I don't know whether they'll accept me now. But if, before thinking all that through, she just went. Why? She was so excited to know Jesus. <laughs> that was all that was on her mind. And you know what? That's going to change all the perceptions that her villagers had of her. And he said, she said, this is her testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? This man is the Messiah. He's right up the way here. Come, follow me. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two more days. I imagine his disciples were having a proverbial cow about then. <laughs> what? We need to get out of here. But no, how about let's just uh, relaxing here for a few days and, and get to know the people. <laughs> let's minister to them. And because of the, his words, many more became believers. Yes. See, that harvest that Jesus was seeing was actually there, and they were coming to him, which is the whole point of a harvest. Yes. In verse 42, and they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. See, that was important for her to say what she said. Mm -hmm. Now we have heard for ourselves. See, now they went to the word and heard for themselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now I've been in church a long, long, long time. <laughs> I was baptized when I was 11. I've been a part of more than one church, and I appreciate the church. However, that being said, the church needs to look at this example of the woman at the well. And they need to redirect. You know, back after Jesus was risen to the right hand of the Father and the church was born at the day of Pentecost, then they were to scatter. They were to leave Jerusalem and scatter into all the world. And my namesake, Thomas, was 
I understand through tradition, went to India yes, and ended up giving his life as a martyr there. Thomas remembers the one who said, Lord, I can't believe unless I put my fingers in your wounds, yes. in your hands, in your side. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Thomas, but blessed are those who will believe by not having to do that. And that's you and me today. But the church grew. The church was persecuted. The Roman Empire said it was against the law to be a Christian. They were persecuted all throughout the Roman Empire. But you know, within 300 years, the Christians of the day conquered Rome. Amen! They did so by sharing house to house. Hallelujah! Their testimony. They prayed for people who were sick and they became well. Amen! They did all manner of miracles because they believed in Jesus. Amen. And they had the story of his resurrection to testify and their own personal journey to testify. Amen. And that's how Rome was conquered. Amen. If we want to conquer the world of Satan with the kingdom of light which we are, then we need to share the testimony we have. Amen about Jesus reconciling us to Himself, yes. but most importantly to our Heavenly Father. Because when we were reconciled to Him, we were also reconciled with our Savior and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And the oneness of God then lived in us, in relationship. 2 Corinthians 5, 14-21 talks about that since this is, has occurred, this reconciliation has occurred, that we are His ministers of reconciliation. And He says it depends on us. Now for the Samaritans to come to Jesus, it depended upon this woman to go back and share that. And He was counting on that to happen. And she did. Amen. Jesus enables us by encouraging us to do what comes naturally in the spirit and he let it happen he didn't get in the way of it but he was there to receive the results and the fruit of it in this woman's life it's an amazing thing you know the church is uh, uh, the, the body of Jesus Jesus is the head and it says in Ephesians 4 that the church is to edify every member for the works of ministry. <clears throat> Unfortunately, you know, I came up through the ranks. I came up as a member, I came up as a deacon, I came up as an elder, then I came up as a pastor. I came up through the ranks. That's how we do things around here. <laughs> Jesus said, I do things to you because you believe. I have made you a minister of my reconciliation and I want you to do it. Mm -hmm. But we have to do it quietly. Otherwise it sounds like sedition mm. sometimes. What are you trying to do? Get around my authority? Mm -hmm. So you see the authority is from Jesus. Jesus says he wants to have us, his army of the church, be under him, <clears throat> under the direction the church is to give, the care and the support. And that's wonderful. The church, though, has to be in alignment now, we are in some serious and perilous times, and we need to prepare for our Lord's second coming. We have a responsibility to bring in the harvest that has already been planted before us. Amen. That responsibility is the churches. We have to participate with Jesus to know how this should be done. The woman at the well is a great example of how that is to be done. Again, he went to Samaria first. First thing he did. Because he knew that that is what was going to go into the whole world. He said, begin in Jerusalem, then go to Samaria, and then to the far places of the earth. Go to the whole world. And the church did that. But you know things have changed. But things are changing right now. Jesus is coming back in Amen. glory. And we need to realize we have a responsibility Every Christian person, just like this woman was a Christian person, she took it upon herself to go to the village and to share, I have met 
the Messiah. Come, join me. And they did. So it's an amazing thing. Now it says over in Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38, that Jesus says about the fields are white for harvest and the laborers are few. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? We are the laborers Jesus was talking about. So we don't need to look any further than us to say, yes, Lord, I'll be in the field bringing in the harvest that you have pointed out to me. It's ripe for the harvest. So we thank you, dear God, that we can participate in your ministry of reconciliation that you have given to us. And you tell us in 2 Corinthians 5, dear Lord, it depends on us to bring in the harvest. And so we ask and pray you'll help us that we'll see your scripture, that we'll apply it into our lives and retake it personally. It'll be, you know, it's like I work with my church. I'm a pastor of my church, in my church. I work with my church, but I also understand I have responsibilities and I have to do these things. I, I report what I do with my church. They say, well, God bless you. Continue on. But you know what? See, I'm being transparent. When we're being transparent with our church governing body, then it's, it's okay. If we try to do th things around the edge, then it's not. Right. We have to go straight through the front door <laughs> and be transparent and be humble and yet be bold. Amen. And say, the love of God compels me to do this. So I support you. Anybody who follows Jesus and wants to come along with me, I'll bring right to your doors. And hopefully we can treat them well and train them well how to be even better servants. So we, we need to work together. This is something that every believer has to become a voice in saying who they are. I'm a child of God. I am a reconciled child of God. I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And I represent the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I applaud my Savior. And I look forward to his coming in glory. And I know we all do. So thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, dear God, for how you're working in and through your people, how you work through the woman at the well, how you work through us to have people who have been planted years ago to come to the fruition of harvest and be white for harvest. And here we are. Say, Lord, use me. Use us. Help us to be all you want us to be, that be your ministers of reconciliation, the ambassadors of your kingdom, that you would receive the glory and the glory would come to the earth and set up the kingdom of God Amen. and the new heavens and the new earth. And we praise you, dear God. In your holy name, Jesus, we all say together, Amen. Amen.